Okay. So hello everyone and welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of October 21st, 2021. So Hadi could not make it today and that's why I'm here. So my name is Marge Bone. I'm a colleague of Hadi at TU Delft and together with Sebastian Geiger from Harriet Watt, I have the pleasure to co-host today's webinar. So we are delighted to host Florian Doster from Harriet Watt University as our distinguished speaker. So Florian obtained his PhD at Stuttgart University in 2011 and is currently a professor for multi-scale, multi-phase flow modeling in the Institute of Geoenergy Engineering at Harriet Watt University and program director for the master program Subsurface Energy Systems. Previously, he worked at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Princeton University and the Department of Mathematics at University of Bergen as well as the Institute of Computational Physics at Stuttgart University. His research interests include the study of multiphysics, multiphase flow phenomena in porous media and their appropriate physical and mathematical descriptions across length and time scales. He focuses on phenomena related to CO2 storage, flow in fractured porous media and hysteretic phenomena such as trapping. His research is funded by the ACT BEIS, the European Commission, the US Department of Energy, the Scottish Energy Technology Partnership, the Norwegian Research Council, the Foundation CMG, Total, BP, and Petronas. So thank you, Florian, for graciously accepting our invitation. And to the audience, please note that this lecture will last for about 30 minutes, followed by questions. And please type your questions in the chat box and Sebastian will take them after the lecture. So please do not wait till the end of the lecture to post your questions, but just type them whenever you feel appropriate as they may trigger questions by other participants. Uh, so Florian, uh, thank you very much for being here and we're all looking forward to hearing your lecture. So please start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Martje, and uh, thank you, Sebastian and Hadi. It's a great honor and pleasure to be uh, invited to present at the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar. Uh, it's a really a, a great, uh, inspiring um, session that has helped so many to get through uh, COVID. And so it's a yeah, it's a great honor to be here, and I hope that um, you'll find um, my presentation interesting. So the title of my talk today is Challenges and Some Solutions of Modeling Subsurface Flow. And broadly speaking, the uh, talk is uh, split into two halves. First, I will discuss uh, motivate subsurface flow that might be not fully needed in, 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 with the audience here today. Talk a bit about model modeling and phrase the challenges. And then I will talk about some solutions in the context of fracture flow modeling. Now, why do we care about subsurface flow? We see here a cartoon with rain falling onto the earth. Some of the water infiltrates into the subsurface. And so here we go, we have subsurface flow. If we're having the opposite process when uh, water is evaporating from the soil, that induces uh, potentially replenishment from uh, groundwater sources. And again, we are having subsurface flow. Now, it doesn't take a genius to link that to uh, some of the uh, most important challenges that we are facing as humanity in the 21st century. Water supply and inherently linked to water supply is food supply. Now, a second reason to care about subsurface flow is fossil energy. Fossil energy receives a, a bad press these days as it's the uh, main culprit for climate change, but it also has uh, supplied us with affordable energy over the last uh, one or two centuries. And uh, if we weren't relying completely on, in, completely on luck, um, when uh, looking for fossil energy, we had to understand how the hydrocarbons migrate from the source rock to the traps, the reservoirs where we would then eventually find them. And then we also had to understand how the fluids flow to the well so that we can produce the hydrocarbons and make use of them at the surface. So again, subsurface flow. 
And um, now subsurface flow could be considered a culprit with climate change, but it can also be part of the solution. And um, with that, I would like to focus on four elements uh, within the energy transition where the subsurface can play a role. So there's first natural gas. Now you might say, hey, wait a minute. Natural gas is a fossil fuel as well, but uh, uh, yeah, no doubt about it. But if we replace coal power plants, for instance, by natural gas power plants, we reduce the carbon footprint roughly by a factor of two. And also natural gas currently is the source for the economic source for hydrogen. Now, the second element is geothermal energy in uh, the earth is pretty hot inside, heat is energy. And if we want to get that to the surface, we um, typically make use of the heat capacity and the mobility of water. So we pump cold water in, get hot water out, and here we go again, subsurface flow is at the heart of it. The third element is geological carbon storage, and that's where most of my research has uh, uh, focused on when I uh, linked the more theoretical conceptual um, approaches to applications. The, the basic idea is that we uh, close the loop. When we take the hydrocarbons out, we harvest the uh, energy, uh, obtain lower energetic uh, molecules, carbon dioxide, and just uh, squeeze it back into uh, the subsurface. And then obviously, again, we need to understand flow there. And the fourth element is then if we want to, uh, or if we get more penetration of intermittent renewables to the uh, energy supply, we will face the fact that not all of them run as uh, nice and smooth and steady as uh, more conventional uh, uh, power plants. And um, in order to match supply and demand, we might have to store energy over long times, maybe seasons, maybe even years at large quantities. And since pretty much all the hydro power uh, storage sites, at least in the, uh, in the European Union, have been built, so there's not much scope for expanding that, um, we can uh, look underground and store energy in terms of gases, hydrogen, or uh, synthetically generated natural gas, or also in form of compressed air. Now, at Harriet Watt, um, at the Institute of Geoenergy Engineering, we've taken these four um, technologies and formulated a new uh, master program that is now running in its second year, subsurface energy systems, and apologies for uh, using uh, these two minutes here to advertise that briefly. So now we've discussed subsurface flow. Uh, now the title contains modeling. So what is a model? And relatively generically speaking, a model is an approximate representation of something. And um, everyone pretty much has encountered that, playing in a sandbox um, as a kid, or maybe also not as a kid. Um, you model how it uh, would be to uh, be a builder, dig some holes, drive a lorry. Um, but also in a more serious aspect, you, uh, we can model outer space by uh, reducing gravity through submerging into an underwater pool. And then becoming more abstract, and I, I really like that uh, example as a physicist. So if we understand the qualitative physical behavior of a system, and we are able to identify an analog system that uh, behaves similar, um, we can use that then to uh, model the representation. And that, in fact, was the, uh, how the first reservoir simulators or subsurface flow models were built in the uh, 50s, because voltage and current in a resistor network uh, behave pretty much the same way as pressure and flux in a single phase flow system. And then, of course, as uh, many of you will relate to, we can also model something by representing physical concepts as mathematical equations that we can then uh, study and solve. 
Now, why do we do modeling? Well, first, it's no denial. It's fun to understand how a system uh, behaves and sort of uh, almost feel like a bit like playing God in generating at least abstract things. But more seriously, uh, we model when wrong decisions are expensive and or irreversible. So the damage that this astronaut in training does in uh, submerged in the pool is way less, both in terms of cost and uh, in terms of his life um, in a pool rather than uh, doing mistakes in outer space. But we also model uh, when we are interested in long times or length scales that are inaccessible for us as human beings. We do CO2 storage. We want to make sure that the CO2 stays in for at least a millennium or 10 millennia. And that's time that is inaccessible for us as human beings. And last, um, if we have limited data, we need models to understand and interpret those and to evaluate uncertainties. Now, as a physicist with a German passport, it's hard to resist to quote Einstein at some point in your presentation. And this is the perfect moment for that a quote from him. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And the question that we are often facing in modeling subsurface flow is how simple can we go and still stay on the possible side and not be on the simplistic side? Um, and oversimplify the system. Now, coming to challenges or sometimes curses, depending on the mood of the day of modeling subsurface flow, I like to group them in five categories. The first and obvious one is spatial scales. So, if we're looking at the pore scale, that's where we understand the physics, Navier Stokes equations um, are. Uh, the governing model uh, to describe how fluids flow through the pores, they are on the order of micrometers. But if we want to have an impact in CO2 storage or water supply or uh, a conventional fossil fuel supply, we need to think big. Reservoir scale, that's kilometers. Now, linking these two scales means that a kilometer is 10 to the 3 meters. A micrometer is 10 to the minus 6. From minus 6 to uh, uh, plus 3, it's 9. So we are bridging nine orders of magnitudes. And to make things worse, we also have to look at that in three dimension. So if we want to represent every micrometer just by one bit of information, we would have to deal with 10 to the 27 bits of information just to capture the whole reservoir at one instance. And that's four orders of magnitudes more than what we have in a liter of gas uh, in terms of molecules. The second challenge occurs are the temporal scales that we are looking at. So if uh, bubbles uh, break up in a multi-phase flow scenario, uh, the snap off happens on the order of micro, uh, milliseconds and pore filling on seconds. If we're looking at core experiments, these take minutes to hours or sometimes days. If we are then looking at injection production uh, scenarios in uh, groundwater or um, hydrocarbons or CCS, that then takes place on uh, scales of years and decades. But then if we want to understand the natural migration and maybe dissolution and precipitation, we're quickly talking about millennia. So we get another of 13 orders of magnitudes that we have to take into account. So we are now at uh, 10 to the 40. Uh, good luck with uh, picturing that. The third um, challenge is that almost uh, never we have the luxury of being able to look at processes in isolation. Like I'm taking here an illustration from uh, uh, a proposal for the DETECT project uh, to, to which I'll come back later in the talk of uh, a CO2 storage um, site and how that might lead to leakage along faults. 
So if we inject CO2, the pressure increases. Then if we are injecting in a saline aquifer, the CO2 will displace prime. So we have multi-phase uh, flow. But then since the CO2 is coming from the surface, um, it tends to be cooler. So we uh, see some cooling taking place around the well that um, changes the strain and with it the stress. So the rock responds to the changed stress. And then since we're altering the chemical composition, we might also find minerals precipitating or rock uh, dissolving. So, and uh, these phenomenon then in turn, again, feed back into the flow. So all uh, processes are inherently coupled. The fourth curse or challenge is nonlinearity. And to illustrate nonlinearity, um, Quickly, let's have a look at the linear phenomenon. That's the velocity of a person in a train. If a person is walking in a train and we want to know the distance that that person has covered after a certain time, we can simply look at the distance the train has covered at the distance that person in the train has covered and get the overall distance covered simply by adding the two velocities because it's an inherently linear phenomenon. Now, picturing that person walking on the roof of the train, it will experience viscous track. And you might remember from high school physics, viscous track goes proportional to the square of the velocity. Now, if we want to understand the viscous track that that person is experiencing, if we, uh, we have to look at the total velocity, and uh, the total velocity is the sum of the train velocity and the walker velocity. And if we then multiply out that, uh, this bracket, we get that mixed term with velocity uh, of the train multiplied with the velocity of the walker. And that's clearly different from the sum of the viscous drag of the train and uh, the viscous drag of the person in isolation due to its own um, walking velocity. And why is that dramatic? Well, uh, divide and conquer does not work. And that's been the uh, divide and conquer pretty much been the success story of uh, modern science as we know it. And that means that something that might be uh, appearing quite challenging, such as quantum theory for uh, simple atoms, that's a linear theory. So we pretty much understand how that works. While something that's been bothering us for way, way longer the uh, fluid dynamics Navier-Stokes equation uh, is a nonlinear phenomenon, and there's a $1 million price set out if you are able to provide a solution, uh, or proof of existence for an initial and boundary value problem for the Navier-Stokes equation. So not solved. The fifth challenge is the lack of data that we are experiencing. We can see the moon with the naked eye, but we can't see underground. The only way to look underground is keeping the core from when we are uh, drilling a well. Our core is relatively thin, 15 centimeters, 20 centimeters in diameter. Um, so this is really just a point source, but there we then get the detailed information about uh, how the rock is um, composed, and we can put it into uh, the laboratory, measure flow rates through it, or look at the pore structure there. We can then also look a little bit further by sending sensors down the well, cameras, um, uh, resistivity measurements, or acoustics. But this also just like, at best, uh, sensors like a meter or so away from the well. And if we want to look at structure, we rely on seismic. Seismic has the challenge that its resolution is relatively coarse. We only see 10 meters uh, or larger structures. And it's also inherently complicated because it's actually looking at the acoustic properties of the subsurface and how they change. And so there's a lot of interpretation going on. And Essentially, you need an experienced geologist or geophysicist to make sense out of uh, seismic data. The last thing uh, how we can learn about the subsurface is through outcrops. 
That's when uh, formation crop out at cliffs. So there we can uh, study the detailed structure of the subsurface in uh, uh, greater detail. But uh, this then is under uh, completely different uh, conditions, different stresses, different temperatures, and it might have been weathered. All this together, so there's a lot of uncertainty in the data. So we need to look at many, many scenarios. And depending on your mood, you can now add like three, four, five orders of uh, magnitudes of scenarios that you want to add to our 40 orders of magnitudes on top. So there is clearly a need for efficient models. And efficient models, that's uh, what I've been looking at in the context of fractures. Pretty much since I joined Harry and Watt and uh, started working closely together with our uh, co-host here, uh, Sebastian Geiger. Fractures are relevant pretty much for all um, applications that I've mentioned before. Um, why is that? They have a huge impact on flow and they are sensi uh, very sensitive to mechanical and chemical changes. And um, from a more uh, conceptual, intriguing um, side, we have a strong lack of scale separation. So that means like or the apertures of fractures start at the micrometers and then the length is just like occurring on micrometers, centimeters, meters uh, scale. And to add insult to injury, Fractures tend to not, uh, like we can't really see fractures in the subsurface because they are not observable in seismic data. They are too small. And um, unless we are looking at the very small scale uh, fractures and they, uh, that they are distributed all uh, like homogeneously through the reservoir, we can't really see uh, the fractures that we are interested in in a core because they are just too widespread as illustrated uh, by uh, this picture in the top right corner from the uh, Bristol Channel. Now, why uh, do fractures matter? And uh, again, um, I'm showing here work from Sebastian. Um, to illustrate that, we have the same fracture network here in the left and in the right. We have a constant flow rate injection from the left and we are seeing the tracer concentration after 150 days. And the only difference between these two, two, two figures is that the aperture of the fractures in the left one is 10 micrometers and in the right one, 30 micrometers. So we have a relatively marginal change, just a factor of three in the aperture, but a, complete, a completely different behavior of the uh, flow pattern. Now, in this example, fractures were represented explicitly. Uh, uh, there were gridded, uh, like the, there were grids built around the fractures, and then the uh, fractures were explicitly represented as well. And uh, this is very uh, cumbersome and time consuming, but also very uh, computational expensive than to run simulations. So there. Uh, following the 10 to the 40 or 10 to the 45 uh, that I mentioned. So we need uh, simpler models for that. So we can average uh, over fractures and matrices. And sometimes we are able to represent them just by one porous medium. But what I want to highlight uh, the uh, next couple of slides, next few slides on it is um, multi-continuum representation. But uh, first, let me also mention that, uh, unfortunately, there's, uh, because we need to adapt the uh, complexity uh, uh, according to the problem, there's not really a, a well-established off-the-shelf uh, simulator. So in our group, we are uh, using the MATLAB Reservoir Simulation Toolbox. You might have uh, attended uh, Knud Andreas Lee's lecture, I think it was in August last year, introducing it. So we are a big fan, very grateful. And we are also uh, contributing to it because it's a, such a nice platform that allows you to uh, 
develop models at uh, quite uh, different levels uh, of complexity. And so we are using that, but we're also uh, developing modules for that. Now coming to the dual continuum model. So I mentioned we have two continua, uh, fracture continuum and a matrix continuum. And the art now is how these two continua talk to each other, interact. When is, uh, like how do we model uh, um, flow that takes place from the fracture into the matrix and vice versa. Typically, um, a linear approach is uh, taken there. So we define some potential and then make the flux proportional to the difference in that potential. Now, the only challenge with that is if we're looking at something as simple as the single phase um, uh, diffusion. which is shown here, the evolution of the pressure in the matrix for a constant uh, pressure in the fracture. If we're taking that linear approach, we see here the blue um, dotted curve over time. And if we're looking at a fine scale so uh, solution or at a um, analytical solution to the problem, we see uh, that at early time, this linear approach is horribly wrong, more than an order of magnitude here. And um, the question is, can we do better than that? So first we looked at spontaneous imbibition and with we, I refer here to mostly Raphael March, but also uh, Sebastian. When we're looking at spontaneous imbibition, capillary forces suck the wetting fluid into the porous medium that's important for water infiltration, but also for oil recovery. And we developed a new transfer concept there. So based on analytical solution and a little bit of physical heuristic, we were able to identify a time when, or first we get an exact match at early time. And then we were also able to identify a transition time at which uh, the early time uh, becomes uh, no longer valid and then transfer to a, a linear approach uh, as conventionally taking. Now the linear approach is still not perfect because the phenomenon of capillary diffusion is inherently a nonlinear diffusive process. And so here we're seeing that there are still limitations uh, by representing that as a linear process. The next thing we, the same team, uh, looked at is CCS in fractured reservoir. Is that possible? Now, first, you need to know that CO2 tends to be the non-wetting fluid. So capillary forces are actually keeping the CO2 out of the matrix. That's unfortunate because the matrix is providing the big storage volume. Luckily, the buoyancy can help us there. So if we surround um, uh, a piece of rock by uh, CO2 in the fractures, then gravity will make the water drain out of the rock. So that's good. The more uh, buoyancy we have here, the easier it drains. Unfortunately, buoyancy also means that the plume spreads underneath the cap rock. And if we want to assess whether CO2 storage in a fractured reservoir is possible, uh, it very much depends on the nuanced balance between these two uh, phenomena. And uh, to study that, we need an efficient model. And again, we looked at uh, some, <coughs> excuse me, some um, analytical solutions to that, uh, looked at physical concepts and developed a transfer model. And we see here a comparison of four uh, different curves for three different formations uh, color coded. So the solid line is what we get when we resolve um, such a, a situation in fine scale. And then uh, the dashed curves are our uh, newly developed model. Then we have in dotted the curve that is con con conventionally used in uh, standard simulators from 83. Uh, uh, and um, a more recent model, 15 years old, is the dashed dotted curve. And what we can see is really that in all three uh, formations, we see some uh, substantial uh, improvement uh, 
uh, through uh, studying in detail uh, the physical processes here. Now we can take that one step further and look what does that mean for an application. And we took uh, data here from aquifers that uh, in the US that have been suggested for CO2 storage and hypothetically asked the question what happens, yeah, what would happen if these reservoirs were fractured. Now two things we need to uh, uh, look at. The first thing is do we get the CO2 into the formation but then also can we control the plume such uh, that it's not uh, leaving the storage complex. And we see here in this bar diagram in red, the fractured case. So we see an increased, um, uh, in many cases, an increased storage volume because we have an increased injectivity through the uh, increased permeability there um, compared to the blue unfractured case. But then if we uh, hone in, the injection rate to make sure that the CO2 stays in the storage complex, we uh, get a, a substantial reduction. But um, the bottom line here is that it really depends on the specific circumstances. Uh, there's not a general no towards CCS in fractured reservoirs. Now you might have um, like read between the lines that constructing such a transfer concept is quite cumbersome and uh, requires quite some creativity. So we've been looking at whether we can use uh, machine learning, since it's become so popular, to avoid exp implicitly expressing such a transfer complex, such a transfer uh, function. For that, we need to generate lots of data that we can then use machine learning on to uh, develop a surrogate constitutive model, and then we need to feed that into our reservoir simulator. This is still relatively early times. We've just submitted a paper in archive and uh, submitted that paper also uh, to a peer reviewed journal. Uh, what we see here is a, uh, so we are raising the pressure in the, in the fractures at a step, and we see the evolution in the uh, matrix uh, illustrated here in this log log plot, the same plot that we've seen before. And I can now detail a little bit the free curves that are, are uh, pretty much close to each other. So we have a micro scale, fine scale simulation. We have an analytical solution in black and green uh, dashed. But then we also have this DPML, the dual porosity machine learned transfer. And that is really able to uh, uh, represent that uh, a transfer process. The challenges are what are the appropriate machine learning techniques, what um, parameters are fed into the model, and how do we make uh, um, a simulator being able to use uh, that, uh, that model. We then all, uh, uh, we also looked at can we, um, so, so far we've looked at just two phase flow in that. The question is, can we uh, go multi-physics? Can we combine, uh, in fact, this dual porosity modeling to mechanics? That has been uh, done for quite a while, um, but uh, we've looked at it in a, a little bit greater detail and, and identified uh, some constraints um, that we would have to take into account. Uh, so, so like the macroscopic model, we cannot just formulate them the way we want. Uh, the, depending on the formulation that has implication on our picture of uh, what micromechanics we are uh, representing there. And uh, the element of looking at uh, or what is taking place when we are looking at a, a fractured medium and squeezing that. So, and uh, obviously, from uh, this uh, picture of the crystal channel. We're looking at fractures there. They are pretty much void space. They deform differently under stress or strain than the matrix does. So that in turn means that the pressure uh, develops differently. So this in turn induces flow, but then the pressure changes. So that means the stress changes again. So this has all uh, needs to be all taken into account. And I'm just showing here a simple example where we were able to then also represent it explicitly on the fine scale, just like uh, 
fractures in parallel. And then to the right or in the center, we see the evolution of the pressure. Solid curves are uh, the dual continuum representation. Dashed curves are the fine scale representation. The red curves are the uh, fracture pressure. And the blue curve is what is taking place in the matrix. We see a good match here. And on the right, we see the integrated volumetric strain over the whole system in dashed for the dual continuum and in red for the fine scale. And again, the match is reasonably well. So now we've looked so far at fractures in the reservoir, but fractures in seals are also quite important. And I uh, quickly like to uh, present here what we've contributed to the DETECT project. DETECT project was funded by ACT and um, uh, incorporated four uh, different groups or entities, Shell, RWTH Aachen, RiskTech, and uh, Harriet Watt. And together we determined the risk of CO2 leakage along fractures of the primary cut rock using an integrated monitoring and hydromechanical coupling approach. And so our contribution there was taking the experimental understanding from the micro scale, feeding that into uh, the meso scale so that then our project partners at Shell uh, could look at basin scale modeling representing our improved understanding of what's going on in the damage zone of faults. At the uh, fine scale, the micro scale of an individual fracture, we developed a uh, virtual element method, uh, uh, method com uh, com combined with contact mechanics so that we can squeeze actually two surfaces and the surfaces we got from optical scans. Now I have to say, uh, Currently, we are only able to do that in 2D. And then we pushed fluids through the gap and solved it with, the, uh, uh, with a Stokes equation. From that, we got a stress permeability relationship for an individual fracture. And we see here in the bottom right the, uh, uh, the data for um, such a stress perm relationship from an ex um, experiment and different uh, modeling approaches. And we see that uh, the numerical approach, like at least on eyeball norm, represents the data the most accurately. We then took this data and um, map, uh, like for an individual stress uh, permeability relationship of a fracture and embedded that into a solver that explicitly represents fracture networks, both for stress as well as for flow. So we uh, modified here this uh, fine scale. Um, we simplified the contact mechanics in uh, this uh, for, for the fractures and then modeled the fluid flow with our own um, discrete fracture uh, matrix uh, code within an MRST. And here we then were actually able to use a fracture network from the Monterey Underground Rock Laboratory. The beauty there is that the fracture network is in situ. It's uh, in a gallery of a tunnel. And the ad additional benefit there is that we have field tests that measured the permeability in the damage zone of the fault. And in this right figure here, we see hollow triangles. Uh, these are simulations uh, from us. And then we see the uh, gray diamonds. These are field tests, uh, permeability values. So quite a decent uh, match there. And then our colleagues at Shell took the information and um, studied cases in the North Sea. Um, for, uh, for, uh, for reservoirs that are target for CO2 storage. But they also benchmarked it against a natural CO2 site, Green River in Utah. That's a leaky fault fracture system. So there's a natural reservoir uh, along a fault. There are leaks uh, and that reach the surface. The fluxes have been measured. 
uh, in great detail and we are uh, and the site has been uh, studied in great detail so there are existing uh, geological models and without any history matching we were able then just in forward modeling to obtain the right location approximately of the uh, fluxes and uh, the right order of magnitude of the integrated flux. And um, I have to say that this work is, has not done by me alone and I just like too many people uh, uh, to be able to mention here, but I quickly want to list uh, uh, them. And then I would also like to uh, gratefully acknowledge funding and then um, come to the take home messages. So first, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. I cannot emphasize that uh, strongly enough. Second point is that even in a, a time of high performance computing and machine learning, because of the immense amount of information reduction we need from 10 to the 45 orders of magnitude to going down, let's say, at most uh, a million or a billion, um, we still need uh, physics-based modeling. And uh, then advancing the understanding of subsurface flow to tackle global challenges requires the collaboration of geologists, engineers, physicists, and mathematicians. And I'm very fortunate uh, to be uh, located in the Institute of Geoenergy Engineering here with colleagues such as Sebastian Geiger, where we are where we have been doing uh, that, this interaction of engineers, physicists, geologists, and mathematicians. First in the uh, oil and gas environment, but uh, more and more in, uh, in uh, research topics along the energy transition. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you very much, uh, Florian, for this uh, very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure there are uh, plenty of questions, um, Sebastian. Yes, um, thank you very much, Florian, for, for the many questions and also featuring some, some of our joint work. Um, always a pleasure to have worked on all these topics with you. And we do have questions from Yuan Wang. Um, set this up. She says, hi, Florian, thanks for the very interesting talk for CCS. Refracted reservoirs on site 2022. 20, would you comment on how you obtain the fracture properties, orientation, density in those reservoirs? Let me go to 22. Um, so, yeah, the, um, this is a, a generic uh, study. So, we took the permeability of the uh, of the rocks there, they have been measured. And then we assume the factor of 1,000 in terms of um, permeability for the individual fractures and um, a, a pretty generic uh, assumption for fracture density and so on. So this is really more a qualitative study than um, uh, explicitly pointing can we do in this uh, formation? We were mostly looking at getting an idea, what is the range in, uh, like how does this, trans how do these transfer processes, um, like how does buoyancy play out in, in this setting? Thank you, Florian. So we go over to um, Kishan and he, as how important is modeling the nonlinear mechanics of, res of the reservoir medium and fracture in at the reservoir scale to study CCS or hydrogen storage? That's a very good question. And if we, um, we had an answer, uh, or if you have an answer for that, you're probably uh, shutting down or shooting down quite a few proposals that have recently been written, written or are currently written across the world, um, the, the coupling between mechanics and uh, flow is uh, still in the infancy and um, or uh, maybe there has been some substantial improvement over the last decade, but um, it's still 
there's not like one um, out of the shelf simulator for that. And uh, in our studies, we rely on linear poroelasticity apart from that the nonlinearity that you introduce by contact mechanics uh, and by uh, slip conditions and, and, and so on in, in fractures, uh, like this is something that you need to feature. You know? Like there's no point in looking at it without this uh, nonlinearity, but then like cyclic loading, what does that do to the weakening of uh, uh, the rock material? How does plasticity in mud rocks uh, play in? All exciting um, research questions that um, are uh, like uh, at least I am currently not able to to nail it down into a, a single answer to that excellent question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Florian. Um, really mean asked. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Would you expect that? storing hydrogen fractured reservoirs is possible. What differences would you expect when storing hydrogen fractured reservoirs compared to CO2? So I, I haven't uh, looked at in uh, per, uh, personally very much at the um, PVT properties of hydrogen in the subsurface, but as far as I understand, and uh, maybe um, the hosts can correct me here if I'm wrong, Hydrogen stays a gas in the subsurface, so we have much more buoyancy. But as we, uh, as I explained, buoyancy brings the hydrogen in, but also um, leads to a spreading of the hydrogen. Now, the spreading is something. So, yeah. Uh, now I'm I'm thinking as I'm talking here. I have to admit. So, like for hydrogen, the volume that you would consider is probably substantially less than CO2. So uh, you would probably want to go into like more anticline traps instead of open reservoirs. Now, if you have a nice anticline trap, then uh, the plume spreading is not so much of an issue. Um, that in turn then uh, would not make the um, uh, the, the, the spreading as uh, as much of an issue, and then uh, we could um, benefit from uh, like if the the fractures are bound to the reservoir, that would mean that um, we probably could have an enhanced injectivity in uh, uh, in hydrogen. But um, this is really like um, life thoughts, so. Uh, take that with a pinch of, uh, with, uh, with a grain of salt. I think, um, so we have collaborated on various topics together. So my very pragmatic engineering view would be, probably wouldn't go on to some of the most complex reservoirs, heavily fractured reservoirs as your first storage site for either CO2 or hydrogen. We try to learn and get the, get the pilots working in, um, in unfractured as homogeneous sandstones probably as possible. The interesting question then is what happens if you do have fractures that you missed in your reservoir characterization, they enhance permeability. How does that impact storativity, pressure build up around wells and so forth? Um, yeah, going back, coming to very practical question here from Luis Salo. Thank you for the great talk flow and what scale size are your MRST simulations for fractured cap rocks? Is the March at all 2020 paper the best reference to learn about this work? So um, the uh, the March at all is definitely the uh, best reference to learn about our uh, approach. In terms of scales, um, we are going like in the detect project. We've been going through all the scales pretty much. So. Uh, we, we have the individual fracture scale and then the lengths do not really matter. We're just looking at uh, an individual fracture and uh, we can there adapt to uh, like this can be a micrometer aperture, millimeter aperture, uh, centi yeah, you wouldn't probably go to a centimeter aperture any, uh, there, but then like the fracture networks as uh, presented here, 
uh, they were, uh, or the, the results I've shown there, were from a gallery that is uh, four by four meters, roughly. But we are also uh, currently working on a, a manuscript that looks at the um, fracture network from a whole outcrop together with uh, Roberto Rizzo and Andreas Busch from an uh, outcrop from Svalbard that's then spanning tens of meters, um, maybe even hundreds of meters. I need to double check on that. But like, uh, there's no inherent limitation to the scale there, but we are trying to bring, like to study how we can average quantities over a meaningful environment and feed them then as um, implicit models on a larger scale. Thank you. Um, here's a name that's very familiar to you. One of your former PhD students, Saideep, says, Hi, Florian. Any plan of integrating reactive transport in studying the evolution of fractures and potential impact on poorer mechanics? So uh, the reactive trans, yeah, uh, hi, Saideep. Thanks for joining in. Um, so the uh, there it, within the tech, we also were looking at uh, reactive uh, flow. The results are not as mature yet, so we're still working on them. Um, but they first were looking, or there we were first looking at um, the impact in isolation. In other words, does the uh, change in pH, does the change in chemical composition in the fracture change uh, the fracture aperture and leads to uh, sealing there. Uh, there's really no, uh, like we are not at the, in a position to actually uh, conclude on that. But then uh, obviously it will be exciting then also to link how that uh, cementation changes the mechanical properties and whether that has an impact on um, on uh, the leakage risk. So um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking live here. Like uh, there, uh, I could picture some interesting um, interplays. The uh, precipitation of calcite would first reduce the aperture on the short term, but then comparing a cemented um, reduced aperture fracture over longer time when um, the plasticity of the mud rock would allow to, the uh, uh, non-cemented fracture to seal. If we have structure, cemented structures in the fracture there, then that might lead to keep them open. And so we would get an intriguing interplay again of different phenomena. Yeah, the reactive transport side and fractures, I think there's still a lot a lot to be learned and a lot to be to be done. Um, from one of the former PhD students to one PhD student who is about to get examined by you in the near future. <laughs> um, that's Ali's chance to ask the future examiner the question. <laughs> so, thanks, Florian. Very nice take um, talk with high uncertainty in the subsurface. How can we actually measure the confidence in the result of your simulations? And Taufik. Okay. Nasan has a very similar question. Says, Thank you for the nice presentation. Do you think simple models are giving reliable results that one can build on them um, important management decisions? So how do we know, how do we deal with uncertainty and how do you know that um, the so, models have been uh, simple the, enough but not too simple? It's uh, like in terms of dealing with uncertainty, I know that Ahmed El Shaikh, our colleague, is presenting, I think still this year, so maybe that's uh, 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 like he is uh, uh, studying how robust uh, we can quantify uncertainties. So that's uh, more like kind of an immediate adword uh, uh, for, for uh, that talk. Now, in terms of how um, robust are these simplified models? So, um, there is no like kind of the German translation or, or like a German saying it would be there is no, uh, I need Rainer Helmick now, um, 
the egg producing uh, woolen pig that, uh, that does it all. Um, Eierlegende so, Wollmilchsau. Genau. <laughs> um, so it is really like we, I, I would not use a simplified model to then uh, come to a very detailed operating decision. But what we can do with simplified models is we can scope the uncertainty and uh, sort of investigate where we get the most bang for our buck uh, when we invest into much finer resolved um, uh, simulations. So like we, we can do, let's say, a, a thousand, a million of um, um, quick and dirty um, reduced complexity model simulations, uh, understand the parameter space in greater detail, and then pick um, three, four, five model uh, uh, parameter settings that we then really want to uh, study in detail or understand also where the uncertainties are the most, and then um, do lab work, do field work uh, to characterize the the problem, it, like to understand which information um, will help us the most in uh, de-risking our uh, our endeavor. You, you talked about you spoke about sort of getting the bang biggest bang for the buck and um, understanding how as we add more information to the models we can understand um, how the um, model outcomes change. So related to that is Yuan second question it says for field scale CCS simulations how do we is it necessary to capture gravity induced convective fingering in the post injection period in fractured reservoirs, I assume. The mesh size for practical geological models seems to be too coarse to describe such dynamics. So that would be a case where you may need more resolved models to get the right bang for the buck. Yeah, so um, I know a few people have looked at um, that. Um, at the end, what um, the convective mixing does is it accelerates the dissolution of CO2 into the brine. And uh, uh, this is uh, by all means pretty much enhancing uh, the uh, storage safety. Now, this is a process that takes to uh, the typic in typical reservoir properties. Um, looks at establish or establishes itself on the time scale of centuries roughly speaking now in a de-risking approach we could then take a, so if we're ignoring the uh, uh, the um, convective uh, enhanced uh, dissolution in a simulator, that means that in terms of leakage risk, uh, we would take a conservative approach. So the a leakage risk reduces if we take that into account. Now, if we want to be on the cautious side, then this could be something uh, that we would happily uh, drop in the uh, bigger scoping study. Thank you. We have sort of time for one last question, and I'm going to pick um, one by Andreas Gilich. Um, are you also working on new numerical techniques to solve the governing equations? I would love to, <laughs> and I have done in the past. Um, so um, the answer is, um, it depends. <laughs> Currently, we are more focusing on uh, the the application side, but like there is definitely also an interest in uh, looking at uh, numerical methods around that. And if you uh, check my um, Scopus profile, you will find a few few papers on that. <laughs>
Thanks. That was a quick answer. So I'm going to give you the chance for one because a few questions on the machine learning side. First, just very quickly clarify something. Kiara asks, hi, Florian, what is your training data? Where does your training data for the machine learning come from? Do you train your data based on analytical solutions? Yeah, so um, that's another uh, short question, short answer. Uh, indeed, correctly. So for this particular case, or we selected this particular case, because it's an environment where everything is cheap, uh, uh, cheaply accessible. So we can really focus on the challenges of uh, how much information do we need to provide? Um, uh, how does the, like, how do, uh, do errors accumulate? So we can formulate the solution um, uh, for the pressure evolution and uh, learn the the method against that but what we are actually interested or like what our model needs is uh, the uh, derivative of that um, we we need to understand how the pressure changes and that uh, then uh, it's obviously substantially more noisy and more risky to failure than in 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 a simulator where we just go forward and we don't have the ground proof in that setting. Okay, thank you very much for, for a very nice talk. Thank you for to the audience for the great question. Thank you also for, for the great collaboration over many years. Um, Mathieu, over to you for announcing our next speaker. Uh, yes, yeah, so again, thank you very much, Florian. Uh, so yeah. I would like to introduce, uh, yeah, thank you, our uh, next week's speaker. Uh, so next week we will host Delphine Rubinet from CNRS, who will speak about what can we learn from electrical measurements uh, with applications to fractured rocks from laboratory to field scale. So uh, until next week, and as Hadi says, stay happy, healthy, and tuned in to our geoscience and geoenergy channel. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.